Non-returning boomerangs have been used for at least 20 to 30,000 years, with the oldest known example carved from a mammoth's tusk. These non-returning boomerangs were used for hunting and were carved for straight flight and to stay in the air as long as possible when thrown correctly. The hunter was then able to throw the primitive boomerang great distances and hit an animal to be eaten for dinner. These animals were often small game, but even the likes of kangaroo or emus can be sufficiently injured by a deadly weighted boomerang such that the animal can no longer outrun Run the hunters. Possibly when shaping a non returning boomerang, someone accidentally carved a boomerang into a shape that, when thrown correctly, came careening back towards the owner. It wasn't exactly useful for hunting or warfare. It was difficult to aim, and if it actually hit its target, it wouldn't come back anyway. There is some conjecture that returning boomerangs could have been used for flushing certain game, but there is little in the way of actual evidence to back up these claims. As such, most scholars believe that because returning boomerangs don't serve much of a functional purpose in hunting, they were simply used for sport, possibly first by the Australian Aboriginals, although ancient Egyptians and many other cultures also made them. Tutankhamun actually had a collection of returning and non-returning boomerangs. So how do they actually work then? While there are numerous ways to make a boomerang, traditionally returning boomerangs are lightweight, being made of wood, and they consist of two separate wings which meet at an angle in the middle. The middle section forms the central point around which the wings will be able to spin, stabilizing the flight pattern. It is the wings that make the returning action a thing. Boomerang wings are fashioned much like airplane wings. They are flat on the bottom and precisely rounded on the top, which deflects the air such that there is less air pressure above than below. Though not, as the common myth goes, because to quote said oft-touted explanation, when air rushes over the curved upper wing surface, it has to travel further than the air that passes underneath, so it has to go faster to cover more distance in the same time. According to a principle of aerodynamics called Bernoulli's law, fast-moving air is at lower pressure than slow-moving air, so the pressure above the wing is lower than the pressure below, and this creates the lift that powers the plane upward. Given we explicitly pointed out that this was a myth, you've probably already spotted a flaw right off the bat in the idea that two given air molecules inherently need to rejoin at the same time at the other end of the wing after being separated. In truth, in a simplified nutshell, the design of the wing manipulates the air such that the air molecules above get essentially stretched into a bigger volume, thus lowering the pressure above, while the air molecules below have the opposite happen, being slightly compressed, increasing the pressure below. It is this difference in pressure between the two that causes the observed difference in airspeed, not the other way around, nor some bizarre supposed physics property that requires air molecules forced apart to rejoin at the other end of the wing with the exact air molecules that they were previously near. And in fact, the air molecules rushing over the top will arrive at the back much faster than the air molecules they were previously near that go under the wing. They will not arrive at the same time. It should also be noted that further lift is created via the downwash that occurs at the rear of the wing thanks to the design and various pressure differences all coming together at that point. So back to boomerangs. As anyone who's ever tried to throw a boomerang knows, it's not all about the shape. You also have to throw the boomerang correctly in order to get it to come back to you. That is, you need to throw it somewhat vertically, holding it by one wing with the other wing pointed up. Think opposite to how you would throw a frisbee with the center pointing towards you. And here's why. As the boomerang spins through the air, the wing at the top of the spin is moving through the air at a faster rate than the wing at the bottom, because it is moving in the direction of the throw, while the wing at the bottom is going the other way. The result is that the top portion will generate more lift than the bottom portion as it cuts through the air. You might think from this extra lift on the top versus the bottom that a new rotation will be introduced around the center point and that it would still fly in a mostly straight line. Instead, thanks to its significant angular momentum, this is not the case. The difference in lift between the top and the bottom then creates a torque which ends up tilting the plane of rotation slightly such that the boomerang ends up flying in a curved path through the air. This is more technically known as a torque-induced precession or gyroscopic precession. Since the torque applied here is going to be reasonably constant through the short flight of the boomerang and the angular momentum likewise stays relatively constant, the boomerang will fly in something of a cone pattern. Thus, if thrown correctly and the wind or the like doesn't interfere too much, the boomerang will come right back to you. For those inexperienced with catching the boomerangs and to start out throwing a relatively heavy one, this is not always a good thing. And now for a bonus fact. 
Speaking of flying toys, while man has been throwing frisbee-like objects around for many thousands of years, the frisbee itself is something of a modern invention. The tale of the frisbee starts with a former building inspector, Walter Morrison, and his investor, Warren Francione. Morrison is considered to be the inventor of the frisbee, though in truth his flying disc was not called a frisbee, and while extremely close to the design of the modern flying disc sold under that name, it's not technically the current patented design used for the standard frisbee, as we'll get into shortly. In addition, Morrison's design was notorious for wobbly flight as it flew through the air, something a few later tweaks fixed. Nonetheless, Morrison did get the ball rolling with the modern toy and sporting item, getting the idea for selling such flying discs after he and his wife were tossing a tin cake pan back and forth on a beach in Santa Monica, California. Some people watching offered to buy their cake pan from them for 25 cents. Morrison noted, That got the wheels turning, because you could buy a cake pan for 5 cents, and if people on the beach were willing to pay a quarter for it, well, there was a business. He then set about selling these tins at Beaches, a small business that was put on hold thanks to World War II. The war wasn't all bad for the future development of the Frisbee, as Morrison learned quite a bit about aerodynamics as a pilot during World War II, which helped him move beyond pythons. After the war, he came up with the Whirl Away flying disc design that flew more accurately and further than pythons. With Warren Francione financing him, he started selling this flying disc under a new name, Flying Saucer, at various fairs. This went over fairly well, but soon Morrison found himself flying solo when Francione left the partnership in 1950. Morrison soldiered on, further improving the design over the next few years, and now selling his flying disc under the name Pluto Platter, picking the name with the same motive as Flying Saucer, hoping to continue to capitalize on the UFO craze in the United States at the time. In 1957, Morrison was approached by Rich Knurr and A.K. Mellon, owners of the Whammo Toy Company, and convinced to sell the rights to the Pluto Platter to Whammo. In order to help boost sales, they renamed the Pluto Platter Frisbee, referencing the more popular name for flying disc toys in New England at the time, Frisbee. The latter one being spelt slightly differently. This was coined after the pythons commonly used as flying discs on college campuses in New England from the Frisbee Baking Company out of Connecticut, founded in 1871. Frisbee was trademarked, so they simply changed the spelling to Frisbee. Enter Edward Steady Ed Hedrick, who is largely responsible for the Frisbee becoming something more than just a fad toy item and perfecting the design. Hedrick got a job at Whammo when he volunteered to work for them for free for three months with no conditions on what they did after the three months were up. He first applied in the traditional manner, but couldn't get a job that way. The project they assigned him during this period was the Pluto Platter, which he set about improving in a myriad of ways. After the three months were up, Whammo not only decided to hire him, but also paid him for the three months it just worked, even though they were not obligated to do so. Within a decade of being hired, he became the CEO of the company. Among many other things frisbee-related, Hedrick was responsible for, he most notably helped to make disc golf a thing in a variety of ways and implemented and patented a series of improvements to the original flying disc design, patent number 183626. Particularly, he was looking to make the frisbee fly further and more accurately by adjusting the rim thickness and top design, including adding concentric circles to help stabilize flight and to give people something to grip better with to help increase spin rate. Hedrick's patent number 3359678 is the patent number you'll find on most standard Frisbee brand Frisbees that are sold today. Hedrick died on August 14, 2002 at the age of 78. Per his request, his children had his ashes mixed into plastic, which was used to make a batch of Frisbees. These were distributed among some of his friends and relatives, as well as being auctioned off, with the proceeds going towards a Frisbee and disc golf museum. Shortly before his death, Hedrick stated, I felt the Frisbee had some kind of spirit involved. It's not just like playing catch with a ball. It's the beautiful flight. We used to say that Frisbee is really a religion. Frisbeetarians, we'd call ourselves. When we die, we don't go to purgatory. We just land up on the roof and lay there. And indeed, Hedrick told his son Daniel that he wanted his ashes to end up in a frisbee that accidentally lands on someone's roof. In order to honor this request, one of those frisbees with Hedrick's ashes embedded in it was thrown by his wife Farina onto the roof of the Ed Hedrick Memorial Museum, where it presumably remains to this very day. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below, and don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos just like this every day of the week. For more from me, why not check out another channel I do called Biographics, notable people from history or who we cover on that channel. I will link to it below. And as always, thank you for watching.